Welcome, friends, to Grace Baptist Church this Wednesday night, the last Wednesday night of the year 2020. Been kind of a tough year, hasn't it? Thank God he's been with us every step of the way. Got a brand new year starting just two days. Today is December the 30th, Wednesday night. And uh, we're going to continue where we left off a couple of weeks back before Christmas. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas and enjoyed time with your family and friends. And I know God blessed you in many ways. Just to let you see another Christmas, that's a blessing in itself. And to be able to celebrate how good God's been to all of us by allowing his son to be the greatest gift that's ever been given, the Lord Jesus. But anyway, take your Bible, turn with us, Proverbs chapter number 12. We're looking at the merits of work. Solomon is the writer. We've seen how that he is encouraging us to use our time wisely, not to waste our life, but to use it wisely and to work hard. And I think God blesses that hard work. He told Adam, Adam, you're going to have to earn your living by the sweat of your brow. That's why I always like to sweat a little bit when I preach. <laughs> so I'll be biblical. But anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll look at our passage. Continue what we were looking at just a few weeks back, the merits of hard work. Father, thank you again for the year that you have given us in protection, Lord, and for looking after us. We've all been through trials. We've all had burdens and heartaches. God, as your people, we've always been able to look to you for help, and you've always been right by our side. So I pray tonight you'll take the message implied into our hearts as we look at a brand new opportunity, a brand new year. Let us use our time wisely in the year 2021. Father, we ask that you'll just lead us and guide us, protect us, fill us with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when you look here, as I said, Solomon, he is trying to teach his son, Rehoboam, the value of being a hard worker. He's going to be the next king. Sadly, Rehoboam rejected his daddy's advice and listened to what the young men had told him to do, and he got into a civil war. The whole nation split because Rehoboam rejected the advice that Solomon had given him. But when you look at verse number, chapter 12, verse number one, Solomon said, Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. So this is an admonition here to study the, the word of God. Make it a point this new year to read your Bible every day, to pray every day. Of course, when the COVID is cleared up, I try to encourage everybody, be in church as much as you can, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We have a Sunday morning service now at 10 o'clock. We'd invite you to come be with us, but wherever you are located, find you a good Bible preaching church where the gospel is preached and where Jesus is lifted up. And you'll grow as a Christian in the year 2021. But God is telling us, if you love the instruction of the word of God, then you're going to love knowledge. You're going to love wisdom. God is going to help you. And when you think about it, he said, if you hate knowledge, if you hate reproof, somebody's trying to correct you, somebody's trying to help you, that's brutish. <laughs> that word brutish in the Hebrew language carries the idea of a cattle that's very brutish, very ornery. <laughs> You've seen bulls that charge and run people out of the pasture. I've seen that myself. Very foolish what the word implies. The wise person knows discipline and instruction brings its own reward. But yet a person who hates instruction the Bible said they're not a wise person. They're very foolish, according to the Bible. So just listening to the Bible, teaching and preaching, reading your Bible daily, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. I can't tell you how many times I've had people in our church as we challenge 
our people from time to time. Read your whole Bible every year. You'll read three or four chapters a day. You'll read it all in a year. And so many have said, boy, it's really changed my life. I have really been on fire for the Lord because of that quiet time, reading the Bible, praying. Then verse 2, a good man obtained favor of the Lord, but a wicked, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. God favors those who favor God. If you have God in your life and you're following in his footsteps, he's going to favor you. He's going to bless you. But when we turn our backs upon the Lord, then we're not going to have the help that we need. And we're no match for life. We need help. <laughs> All of us are weak. So thank God when you come to the Lord and draw nigh to him, he draws nigh to you. Then verse 3, a man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. What's he saying there, friend? Well, if you plant your roots in an evil life, eventually you're going to sink down in those roots in despair. Why? Because there's no solid foundation in those evil roots. They're like quicksand. I mean, evil life just brings you down and down and down. But a godly life has a way of giving you joy, has a, give, has a way of giving you peace in your heart. And you can lay down and sleep at night. You know, hey, I've done my best for the Lord. I've tried to follow what he wanted me to do today. And so we know the storms are going to come to everybody, the good and the evil. But yet, when you know Christ, you're anchored, and you're anchored on a rock, <laughs> and you're not going to drift away, and the storm's not going to destroy you, because that rock is none other than Jesus. This kind of reminds us of the parable he told about, that when you build your life upon him, the solid rock, the storms come, the winds blow, the waves come in, but yet you stand like that house built on a solid foundation. But if you try to build a house on sand, and of course the hurricane comes in, it's going to wash the whole house away. There's no footing. There's no foundation there. And that's what happens in the storms of life. If we don't have the Lord, we're not going to make it. Jesus taught us that in Matthew chapter number 7. So to be established means to be successful. A man shall not be successful living a wicked life. Real success comes to those who live a godly life, who follow the Lord. Now let's look at verse number four. This is where we pick up from the last study in Proverbs. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. But she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. The word for virtuous there, that's worthy of note. We know a godly woman will do her husband good. She encourages him to walk closer and further with the Lord. But this word goes even further than that. The word for virtuous carries the idea of a force, an army, strength a band of soldiers, a great company, valiant, virtuous. So a virtuous woman is like a strong army, a band of men, a great host who is valiantly supporting her husband as he follows God's leadership in life. They're working as a team. He loves her and she loves him and he provides for her and she does what she can to help him. It's a it's a hundred percent commitment on both sides. She comes to his aid when he's beaten down, when he's weak. She makes him stronger just by her support, her presence. I love to be around my wife. I just enjoy time with her. She's a gift to me from God as well as my daughter. I thank God for a family. Love to be with my dad and sister. Love to be with my church family. Something about just being around godly people. It builds you up. That virtuous person's like a 
strong army. They come to your rescue when you're in trouble. They lift you up when you're weak and about to fall. <laughs> Sometimes the enemy attacks all of us. Sometimes old Satan tries to get the best of us. But thank God we've got the strong arms of Jesus to hold us up. And those around us who are our godly intercessors, they pray for us. They lift us up to God and they do what they can to encourage us. So that, that's what that means. A virtuous woman is always by his side, holding up his arms when they grow weak. She realizes that when her husband is strong and following God, that he is going to support and bless her life in return. She's going to have a better life. And friends, if you have an unsaved spouse, don't give up on them. God can save that unsaved husband or that unsaved wife. He's done it many, many times. Somebody that's very dear to your heart. You love them and pray for them and support them. Show them the love of God. It'll go a long ways into bringing them to the Lord. They're going to say, there's something different about my husband. Something different about my wife. That godly support. That encouragement goes much further to win them to Christ than always condemning them or preaching to them, telling them how bad they are. Think about it. If you were not saved and your spouse still loved you dearly and helped you in life and you knew that he or she loved God and they loved you, wouldn't that mean more to you than having them tell you, oh, you're going to go to hell one day. You're going to fry like that hamburger one day. You're nothing but a rotten sinner. You better straighten up. The devil's going to get you. <laughs> that just has a way of turning you off, doesn't it? But that person who loves you, who gives you that support, that gentle persuasion, that's the way you can win people to the Lord. Somebody told me a long time ago, if you're going to win somebody to the Lord, your first task is to win them to yourself. Show them, hey, I'm no better than you are. We're all in the same boat here. We've all sinned. Thank God we've got a Savior. His name is Jesus, and he'll save those who come to him. That is going to help you when you tell them about the Lord because they know you're not preaching at them. You're trying to help them by showing them the source of your joy the source of your strength, the, show, the source of your comfort, it's the Lord working through the lives of those around you. Now again, go back to verse number four, a virtuous woman. She's a crown to her husband. She's a help to him. She's like a band of army soldiers surrounding him, lifting him up when he's been beaten down by the enemy. But then notice, she that maketh the shame is as a rottenness of the bones. <laughs> We've seen how the virtuous woman's like a royal crown on her husband's head. That elevates him, compliments him to do even more and be better for the Lord. But then notice when a woman does something to disgrace her husband, like it's kind of like a cancer that eats away at his bones. You know, she embarrasses him in front of somebody else and puts him down doesn't respect him. These are things that are not going to help. They're just going to hurt even more. So we have to realize that when we support our family, we're really supporting ourselves because they're going to lift us up and when we lift them up. When you torment, when you annoy your family, you're only hurting yourself in the process because it's going to come back to haunt you. Think of the wonderful wives who were mentioned in the Old Testament. Eve, Adam and Eve, the very first wife. God performed that marriage. Must have been a wonderful person. In spite of the fact she did listen to the serpent, but she loved her husband. And she stayed right there with him. Sarah, Abraham's wife. Remember Sarah? I believe Sarah was a model wife. And you read about it in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 6. Then the mother of Moses, her name was Jochebed, 
undoubtedly, she's a remarkable woman. She said, Pharaoh's not going to kill my little boy. He's not going to get my little baby. She put him on the Nile River in a little basket. And, of course, Pharaoh's daughter found him. She looked after that little baby. God worked it all out. There's so many we couldn't name them all. But then there's probably, as you read through the Bible, some who were not so good that could be rottenness to the bone. Job's wife didn't help him a whole lot, did she? I've often thought about this. It's kind of interesting. Satan took away from Job everything that he leaned upon except for his wife, took his children away, and Satan took his possessions away and his money and his power and really his prestige. He was a, a very rich, wealthy man, but he was a godly man. And Satan told God the only reason he's godly is because you blessed him. Okay, you go ahead and take his blessings away. He won't curse me. And then it came down to the point, well, skin for skin. You touch his body and he'll curse you. And God said, well, you can do that, but you can't kill him. And that tells me there is a point where God says no to Satan. He would want to kill all of us. Thank God we're in the hands of the Lord. We're in the protection of the almighty God. And so... When he was down in the dumps and he'd lost his children, lost his health, had elephantitis, which means he had sores from head to toe, scraped them with little pieces of pottery to relieve himself, set in that sackcloth and ashes. A terrible time for Job. She didn't go out and help him too much. She went out there and said, won't you just curse God and go on and die? <laughs> that wouldn't encourage anybody, would it? But the Lord got her back. She did get 10 more children. God told Job, I'm going to give you more than you had to start with. I'm going to bless you twice as much. She had 10 more kids. Do you realize? 10 kids, 9 months of pregnancy for each one. That's 90 months of pregnancy she had to endure. That's a lot of morning sickness, huh? <laughs> but anyway, when you look through the Bible... There's bloody Athaliah, whose mother was the wicked Jezebel. And she tries to kill her own son, who was going to be the king. So many illustrations. And it goes the other way, too. There's so many wicked husbands, virtuous wives. These husbands mean to their wives and hurt their wives dearly. Odin Nash gave advice on how to make a marriage a success in a little poem he wrote, to keep your marriage brimming with love in the loving cup. Whenever you're wrong, admit it. And whenever you're right, shut up. <laughs> That's good advice, by the way. <laughs> so we know that a virtuous woman is a crown to a husband. A virtuous man is a crown to his wife. He built her up. He didn't put her down in front of other people. He didn't embarrass her. And yet when that partner for marriage, whether it's a husband or a wife, when they turn on their husband or wife or they're always chewing at them and fussing at them and putting them down, it's just like rottenness to the bones. That's what the Bible said. Love your wife. Love your husband. You say, well, they don't, they don't do a whole lot for me. That's okay. You let God take care of them. You follow God. God will lead you what to do. He'll show you how to handle it. And he knows how to work when we can't. When it's out of our hands, it's still in his hands. I just encourage you, turn to the Lord. Then verse number five. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. A godly person is going to think good thoughts. That produces a good life. While a wicked person thinks deceitful thoughts. That produces heartache, shame. Be very careful about getting counsel from another person. Make sure you're not trying to get counsel from a wicked person. They'll lead you astray. They'll use you for everything you can, they can get out of you and then just drop you off to the devil. And they don't care. I heard this story from J.C. Penney. 
I'm going to close with this tonight. I don't want to keep you too long. I know it's a busy time of the year. Everybody's getting ready. The New Year's coming in. Christmas just finishing up. But let me finish with this tonight. 1929, J.C. Penny's business was highly unstable. So he began to worry and became sleepless. He worried to the extreme and even contracted shingles. That's some of the most severe pain anyone can know is what doctors say. Thank God I've never had it, but I've got some in our church that has had shingles for years. And I pray every day God touches them and heals them, but they still have the joy of the Lord. And it's amazing how God can give them that power to keep going, even under that heavy load that they're bearing. But J.C. Penney, he contracted shingles in the hospital. He was given some medicine just to tranquilize him, try to calm him down a little bit because he thought his business was going to fold up. That didn't help him a bit. He was still so worried about his business. One night he felt that he was just going to die before the next morning. So worried, lying in the bed. And he heard some singing in that hospital from the chapel, which was right next to the room he was staying. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Have you heard that song? What a great song it is. God will take care of you, no matter what you go through. It's in our songbook. We sing it from time to time. J.C. Penny sat there, he said, and he lay in that bed and listened to that song, and God spoke to him, and he knew that God was going to bring him through the test he was under. All the strain, looking like his business was a failure, looking like he was going to die before the next ray of sun shined on his life. Suddenly he leaned up thinking, it is real. It is real. God does care for me. And in no time, he jumped out of that bed. He went into that chapel. And a miracle took place, he said, in his soul. It was as if a little bird suddenly freed him to fly out of that dungeon into the sunlight from hell to paradise. He said, God has always taken care of him. Of course, we know he's in heaven tonight. This is way back in 1929. Look at J.C. Penney in the department stores all over the world. Why? Because God told him, and he was a good Christian man, and he used his time, talent, and treasure for the Lord. Hey, friends, God can do that for you. Whatever's your burden tonight, you give it to the Lord. You let God help you with that family, those friends, on the job. Sometimes there's too much month at the end of the money. We need God's help there, too, financially. Whatever the Lord has for you, it's always the best. Turn to him. He'll help you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for letting us come again and study another part of this blessed book called the Bible. Thank you for this wonderful book of Proverbs. What great advice. What great wisdom it gives us to live our lives, to glorify you. Bless each person that listens in to this broadcast. Lord, if there be one listening that's never come to Christ, let them ask him into their life, repent of their sin, and trust Christ as their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I hope you have a happy new year. God bless you, and thank you so much for tuning in. If you're looking for a church, come down and see us. If you're able to do so, here at Grace Baptist Church, 435 NC Highway 62 West. Till next time, may God richly bless you.